So our text for this morning is Romans chapter 12 and verse 10. Romans chapter 12 and verse 10, really just 10b, the second half of the verse. This verse has captured our attention here at Emmanuel, probably because of the the way that it stands in stark contrast to everything outside of these doors. And God has used Romans 12 and verse 10 in mighty ways here at Emmanuel. So let me just read it to you now. Love one another with brotherly affection. Now, let me just pause right here. If we hear that and what comes into our mind, um, what maybe complicates this for us is the idea of, of masculinity or gender here. Um, the word there for brotherly affection actually is used many times in ancient Greek to talk about the way that parents feel affection for their children. So this is not, um, we're not just talking about brotherhood, though that's a real category in the Bible as well. Um, what, what, what's the, the, the reason it says brotherly affection is the familial love. So that's why that's there. Love one another with brotherly affection, and then, here it is, outdo one another in showing honor. Outdo one another in showing honor. This is God's word. I love this verse. Um, Before we get into that, what are we doing? We are talking about gospel culture right now at Emmanuel. We've been doing that for about the last month. And uh, we took a brief pause last week. Pastor John um, preached a sermon, which in hindsight, I think could be titled something like Hope for the Ballot Box. So if you haven't listened to that, go listen to that before um, you go and vote if you haven't done that already. Because what Pastor John helped us to do there was not feel when we vote as if we were voting on our eternal destination. (laughs) There's just so much settledness in Christ for us. Thank you, Pastor John. Uh, So now we're returning to the the series in gospel culture, and let me just hit this right up front. What is gospel culture? Now, we all know what culture is. Here's a good example of, of um, culture. We in America have a culture of liberty, and it's never more obvious than when we feel like our liberties are being encroached upon by the government, and then we lash out in all kinds of ways. It's, it's you know, it doesn't matter what, if you're Democrat, Republican, or Libertarian, whatever, um, Liberty is not just in our constitutional documents. In other words, it's not just our doctrine. Liberty is also our culture. It's, we even have um, in America a kind of personality of liberty. Um, and in just the same way, the gospel is not just um, located in a book. I mean, it's not, the, the gospel is not just, um, you know, a, a something that we, we take up and believe It's also something that in believing we live out. And what happens when those beliefs of doctrine, or you might say the Bible's constitution, gets into our interiority so that we actually, you know, reorient ourselves to Jesus, we naturally, what emerges is a gospel culture in the same way that we have a culture of liberty, um, but very different. And one of the primary... um, considerations or themes of gospel culture is the idea of honesty. So we've spent the last four weeks looking at honesty from different angles. And now, uh, the reason we started with honesty is because, guys, as Becky just showed us in that wonderful video, until we get honest, we, we, we're not actually um, having fellowship with one another. I mean, until we step out into the light of God's holiness, God's perfection, His goodness, so that we can be seen for who we truly are. And none of us is impressive when we do that. Until we do that, guys, we're just pretending. I mean, we're just in the dark. It can feel very righteous, but the choice that we're all faced with is we can either be known or we can be impressive, but we can't be both. So, Honesty is how we get into a gospel culture. It's how we stay there. That's why here at Emmanuel, we say um, we want every Emmanuel member to do three, three things. Know Jesus, stay honest, and do something. 
Know Jesus, stay honest, and do something. So, um, honesty is where we, get, where we began. Now we're moving to the theme of honor. Without honesty, we can't get into gospel culture, but honor is actually what we do when we get there. And let me just lead off by saying that none of us is good at this uh, because gospel culture is actually something that's coming down to us in this world from heaven. In other words, gospel culture is just the culture of heaven. We, we could just as easily call it heavenly culture. Because that's the case, all of us have to adjust. If you're not adjusting to Jesus in some way, then either you have attained sinless perfection or else you haven't gotten a hold of the real Jesus because we all have to adjust to him. Guys, even, even the disciples that walked the earth and, and like, you know, ate dinners with Jesus and slept, you know, out on wherever with Jesus, traveled the country with Jesus, even they had to adjust to him because he's God. So we all have some adjusting to do, and just a fair warning up front, gospel culture, when we enter into gospel culture, can feel weird. Uh, we can feel a bit like Ricky Bobby and Talladega Nights, if you're familiar with that award-winning film, who, after winning his first major NASCAR race, earns his first TV interview only to find, and I quote, I'm not sure what to do with my hands. It's awkward at first. And we might wonder, what, okay, so I've got on, I, I'm getting honest, I mean, I'm taking that step, but what do I do here? What's the positive reality that we are cultivating here together? The answer to that is honor. That's a big category in the Bible. The Bible has so much to say about honor, I can't go into all of it this morning. For instance, you, you'll probably remember that one of the Ten Commandments is honor your father and your mother. So I'm not going to talk about that one so much today, but that is included, of course, in uh, this mega category of honor in the Bible. But what I want to do this morning is show us the foundation of honor. In other words, I want to answer the question, you know, what is this whole category of honor resting upon? How do we just step through the door into a culture, a gospel culture of honor? And I'm going to do that in two steps. The one is this. Um, here's my first point. Until we feel honored by God, it is impossible, impossible to outdo one another in showing honor. Now, Nashville is, is living proof that we all really want to live in a culture of honor. We have a, a, an entire museum here in Nashville dedicated to the honor of Johnny Cash, and it's pretty great. <laughs> um, every time I turn around, there's some kind of award show to honor people who have great achievements, and that's great. And it's not just in the music uh, scene. You'll notice that our, you know, our colleges, we have many of them here in Nashville, are, are named in honor of people or organizations. And within those colleges, there are you know, departments that are named in honor of people, you know, in buildings named in honor of people who give out scholarships in the honor of people. Um, to scholarship recipients who write dissertations and, and dedicate those to people's honor for which they receive the honor of a degree. I mean, honor makes the world go round. And we might be surprised, some of us, to know that God is not looking down from heaven and saying, oh, you people, would you just get over it already and stop worrying about honor? It's just the opposite. For instance, Romans chapter 2 and verse 7, earlier in this same letter, the Apostle Paul says, to those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory, honor, and immortality, God will give eternal life. Our problem is not that we aim for too much honor. Our problem is that we aim for too little. For instance, Jesus, chapter five, uh, John chapter 5 and verse 44. How can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? In other words, here Jesus is with his gospel, his offer of inheriting 
the, all of the inheritance of the firstborn son of God, and he gets it all. And here he is standing in front of us with this offer of being honored like that. And Jesus is saying the thing that stops you from receiving that kind of honor is actually you're settling for honor from one another. Now, we might hear that and think, well, if that's the case, if, if, if we're meant to aim at the honor of God, then what in the world is the Apostle Paul talking about, outdo one another in showing honor? Is Paul contradicting Jesus by pointing us to one another to outdo one another in giving honor? And the short answer is no. Let me show you why. The, the key to understanding why Paul is not contradicting Jesus is how the chapter starts. Romans chapter 12 in verse 1. So let me just connect the dots for you now. Chapter 12 in verse 1 and then into our verse in verse 10. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, that word therefore is really important. It, it, it's, it's, he's pointing backward to all that he has just said. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by what? The mercies of God. In other words, the, the motivation, the, the impetus, the um, power for outdoing one another in showing honor is knowing that we are the recipients of the mercies of God. Every good commentator on Romans points out that there is, between chapters 11 and 12, a break. In other words, the Apostle Paul's doing something in, ver in chapters 1 through 11, and then he transitions in chapter 12. I'll just give you one commentator. The African commentator, Solomon Andrea, from his commentary on Romans, says this. Paul begins the second part of his letter with the word, therefore. We just saw it. Here, the therefore acts as a bridge between the two main sections of this letter, the one on doctrine and the second on ethics. It reminds us that what we believe has important implications for how we live. Paul, this is important, Paul assumes that the brothers and sisters to whom he is speaking have, like him, received spiritual wealth, or we might say spiritual capacities, that will enable them to fully live out the gospel. That's why he can urge them to respond, what? In view of God's mercy. Here's what that means. Before Paul ever gets to the ethical, outdo one another in showing honor, he spends 11 chapters assuring us of the mercies of God. How God, by God's strength, lifts us up to the place of highest honor through faith in Christ Jesus so that we are treated by the Heavenly Father like His firstborn Son. Because the Apostle Paul knows that our appetite for honor is so massive that only the knowledge that, that we are, uh, to use a, a Pauline expression elsewhere, seated with Christ in the heavenlies, only that knowledge can actually free us up to stop, you know, gobbling up honor from the people around us in a toxic way. Only the gospel can actually make a culture of honor possible. Now, what do I mean by toxic? Until we receive and know ourselves to be in possession of the honor that comes through faith in Jesus Christ, we will always be trying to draw it out of the people around us. And it poisons everything. You know, we'll, we, we all know what this is like. I mean, you, you, you spend all day cleaning the house, um, I've never done that, but I'm just putting myself in the position of my wife, who I have spent a few hours, that feels like all day to me. Um, or, you know, you work really hard on the backyard, or you do something that costs you, and you think when, when you know, my friend or when my husband or wife see this, they're going to 
they're just going to, you know, fawn all over me. They're going to think, this is amazing, way to go. And then they come home and they don't even notice. And you feel dishonored. You might even be dishonored. Or maybe, you know, you find out that you were on the, uh, on the receiving end of a toxic friendship and that you, you didn't really matter to someone else and you didn't know it until, you know, the rubber hit the road and all of a sudden they're just using you for something that you no longer have to give and now you feel dishonored. How do we, what's happening on the inside when that happens? What's happening is the thirst for recognition and validation in the world is not being met. And so either, you know, we just go on trying to pull it out of people in a way that they could never satisfy or else we drive them away by our constant need. Only when we receive the resources of God, the validation of God, the honor of God, are we actually free to serve without needing anything in return. So maybe we are overlooked. God sees us. My wife and I, Jessica, we, we often sit with um, young couples who are either about to be married or who are already married. And inevitably, a question will come up um, that's something like, you know, <laughs> how, how does it seem to be going so well for you guys? And, you know, we have issues just like anybody else. Here, here is the secret to a marriage that just keeps on pushing through obstacles with life. The secret is when one spouse is receiving the grace of God, the honor of God, the validation of God, in just the same way that the other spouse is receiving the honor of God and the grace of God and the validation of God, so that when they, not if they, when they offend one another and tax one another and even do downright rude and mean things to one another, their God is not at stake. So that actually, you know, when on the very rare occasion Jessica does something to me that she shouldn't, um, it's mainly the other direction. I'm actually free to say, you know what? I can just forgive her. And my identity is not on the line here. As a matter of fact, I wonder if she feels honored. You see the difference? I have resources coming down from heaven that I cannot have without faith in Jesus Christ. Just lubricates the gears. The only way that a culture of honor like Romans 12.10 is possible, the only way it can exist in this world is that we know our honor is secure in God. The most beautiful demonstration of this in all the Bible is in Luke chapter 15 in what's come to be known as the parable of the prodigal son. I'll shorten it for you. Jesus tells the story of a father who has two sons. The younger son asks, asks for his, uh, his inheritance early, which is just the same as to say, I wish you were dead. And he goes out and he just lives however he wants to live. And eventually, he runs out of money. And he thinks to himself, even the servants in my father's house live better than the way I'm living right now. And he crafts this great apology to his father with the intent of settling for the status of servant. And he heads back home and his father sees him out on the horizon and the Bible says that he was a long way off when his father spotted him and the father runs to meet him. And before he can even get the entire apology out of his mouth, the father calls for a robe to be put on him and for a ring to be put on his finger. 
and for the fattened calf, that is, the best thing we have to eat, to be slaughtered for a party, for a feast. Why? Is it because, you know, his repentance was so compelling? I mean, he didn't even get to finish his apology. No. It's because the love of the Heavenly Father is so powerful. He's looking for opportunities to lavish honor upon his children, which means Romans 12.10 are the house rules of God. This is the culture of the Father's home. Outdo one another in showing honor. The hard thing to believe in the gospel, guys, the hard thing to believe is not the depth of our sin. The depth of God's love. Don't you find that to be the case? It's lavish. It's expensive. It's costly. It's the hardest thing to believe in the gospel. We wouldn't even dare say it if God didn't say it first, that God wants to honor us. And it's what compels us to love Him and to want to honor Him, His goodness alone, so that when we come to God, we don't bring our our, our record of good obedience in order to compel Him to love us. That's what the older brother is trying to do. And we don't bring our, our self-pity as if we could make ourselves pitiable enough for God to love us. We come to God appealing before Him on the basis of who He is. And doing that, we're received in every single time. It's actually kind of, it's even kind of embarrassing. We know we don't deserve it. It makes us cringe a little bit. And that's good. It's the grace of God melting away the layers of guardedness that we have to live with, or we think we do in this world. If you've never received Jesus like the prodigal son, then you can do that. The reason I know you can do that without knowing what you've done or where you've been or what you've left undone is because he doesn't receive us on the basis of who we are, but on the basis of who he is. You can come to him today and you can discover the freedom of security, knowing that your honor is secure. And that brings about a whole new possibility, a, gospel, a possibility of a gospel culture. I love the way that Ray Ortland Sr. put it one time. He said, there are two ways to walk into a room. Here I am, or, oh, there you are. Receiving the honor of salvation makes it possible to walk into the room the second way. So, here's the amazing thing. Number two, the amazing possibility. Let's be lavish with our honor. Let's be lavish in showing honor. There's a reason that the word begins, uh, that you see the word there, Uh, showing, outdo one another in showing honor. That word's actually not in the Greek text, but it's put in in the English because the, the kind of honor that's being talked about here is not a feeling of honor on the inside. Now, we may or may not have that toward other people. The Bible rarely ever um, sort of attends to how we feel. Um, the Bible is constantly coaching us to um, to tell our feelings to get in line with our convictions. So, 
uh, honor here isn't, you know, a feeling of honor. It's the act of honor, showing honor. That's why it's translated that way. Uh, the Apostle Paul is talking about things that can be seen, things that can be heard, things that can be felt and experienced. The text does not say, outdo one another in feeling honor for one another. The idea is the activity of it all. I read recently of a man who served on the um, staff of, of Paul Bear Bryant when he was a coach at Alabama, and uh, he was a dear friend of, of Bear Bryant's, but he didn't know how much of a friend he was until Bear Bryant died. And years later, he received a letter from Bear Bryant's wife uh, alerting him to the fact that, uh, that Coach Bryant often spoke affectionately about him as one of his most trusted allies and um, loved him dearly. And he was floored. He had no idea how much he meant to him. And I thought to myself, you know, it's a beautiful story, but what a tragedy. What a tragedy to sit right next to people we deeply admire, or people in whom we can see the grace of God, and never say it. Moderate honor is a tragedy. It's a lose-lose. That's why the text starts with outdo one another in showing honor. The Bible doesn't say that about every um, good thing. For instance, there are spiritual gifts that the Apostle Paul says should be exercised in moderation. There are many good gifts that the Bible encourages us to enjoy in moderation. But when it comes to honor, the Bible is saying, no, 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 don't hold back. Take the governor off and just get after it. Honor is one of those things that Actually, the more energy we pour, we pour into it, our world doesn't get out of kilter. It gets in rhythm. It's the way we were meant to live. Because, guys, when we don't honor one another, let's be real, we just fill in the blanks with all the wrong kind of assumptions. When I don't know how you feel about me, and maybe it's just me, I'm just going to assume the worst. But when we actually start not flattering, observing, spotting grace in the lives of people around us, we discover the wonderful, what Tim Keller calls the, the, the f- wonderful freedom of self, self-forgetfulness. And the people around us start feeling loved. And it's as if the form in, uh, of reality in the room changes to the same form of reality that is in heaven above right now. And we are actually participating in bringing in the kingdom of God on earth. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That happens when Romans 12.10 is lived out. That's why Paul brings the strongest language to bear here. Outdo one another in showing honor. Aren't you glad the Bible doesn't say outdo one another in finding faults? Outdo one another in showing critique. Or even, you know, outdo one another in prophesying. I mean, it would, it would put us in the wrong kind of posture towards one another. But outdo one another in showing honor. I mean, the idea there is not only competitive, it's, it's the idea of leadership. In other words, I'm going to take the first step. I'm going to take the initiative. And we can all get in on that. At Emmanuel, you know, there's like a hundred million right ways to do this, okay, but here is, um, rather than try to take like the three-point shot right, right out of the gate, here's a layup. And at Emmanuel, we do this. We do it in small groups. We do it all kinds of places. We call it honor time. And all it is, is, is me looking another brother or sister in the eye and saying, I see the grace of God in you in this way. For instance, here's my beautiful mother who's often been mistaken for my sister. That, that actually probably was flattery. But here, here's, here, yeah, it's, she gave me the thumbs up on it. Um, here, here's a fact. Here is an evidence of grace from the last 24 hours. She watched our children last night, which is, I have three of them, right? Six, four, and two. This is not an easy job. 
and freed Jessica and I up to go to dinner with friends. And she does that regularly. Because one of the reasons she said to me is because it's a way that she can serve me. And oftentimes, you know, I need to be freed up on Saturday night so I can preach on Sunday morning. (laughs) I honor you. Guys, does anybody feel too honored? Out there in the world, it is a competition to outdo one another in jockeying for position or outdo one another in showing contempt. But the form of reality when the grace of God gets down deep into our hearts, in other words, when the love of Christ finds its way into our hearts, what most naturally finds its way out is honor. We actually start being amazed by the people around us. And when we do that, we become, as a community of people, we become a living witness that the love of God is more than theoretical. It can be seen, it can be heard, it can be tasted. It wouldn't be an overstatement to say it's heaven on earth. Who doesn't want to be a part of that? (laughs) I do. We can all get in on it today by receiving the grace of God and by turning our attention to one another with honor. I'm going to go to prayer now, and I just want to leave a, a moment of quiet up front. Here's why. Let's ask ourselves the question, Do we feel the honor of God? Do we know ourselves to be honored by God through faith in Jesus Christ? If not, let's go to him and let's let's bring that to him. Let's go to prayer now. Our Heavenly Father, we long for your smile. And Father, we know that you long to give it. So I pray as each one is searching his or her heart that you would affirm or perhaps give for the first time the assurance that you are pleased with us through faith in Jesus. I pray for every prodigal in the room that they would come to you now with nothing to compel you to love them, but on the basis of who you are and that they would receive the robe and the ring and the party. And I pray for every older brother, for everyone who has been trying to obey their way into your honor, that they would just throw that aside and come into the party that's already prepared for them through faith in Jesus Christ. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he has opened the door to being an heir of God, to the family of God, to security, to affirmation, validation, honor. Settle us down deep in your love, Father, this morning. And from that place, God, turn our eyes, lift our eyes from self to the glory of God all around us. And open our mouths by the power of the Holy Spirit to outdo one another in showing honor. 
and make us, Father, a compelling witness to the reality of the love of Jesus in the world today. We ask in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Let's stand and continue in worship.